Good morning. So, welcome to our third and final day of our conference. We'll, we'll just get started with our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Stephen Ekovich from the American University of Paris, speaking on cultural resistance and assimilation in the French Empire. Thank you, David. But, but before I start, I would like to explain why I'm interested in this. For most of my adult life, if I count my military service in Vietnam, in the intelligence service, I've spent most of my life, 50 years, wandering around the French Empire. Uh, that's also partly because I, I have, um, uh, at the behest of the American State Department, for example, been to almost every French-speaking country in Africa uh, to run workshops, e either trying to explain American politics. It's one. It's the, the Americans do this. They let professors have free speech and explain, even criticize in, in front of diplomats, uh, American policy, American politics. Uh, but also there was a the period when the Americans were interested in democratization. Uh, and so I often did democracy workshops, not only in Africa, but also in the former Soviet sphere. And the way I did that, I, I, never, I never lectured at Africans uh, about democracy. I would open up uh, a safe space for discussion so they would discuss among themselves and I would learn that way also. And most recently, the American State Department has focused on young. There's always a day that's dedicated to, to the young generation. So over 50 years, I've had experience with, uh, well, uh, I would say three generations of, uh, of Africans, but also the, on one side of my wife's family is a Creole family from Guadeloupe. Uh, so just through family connections, uh, I've had a long experience with the French West Indies uh, and the literature of the French West, in West Indies. So um, I would change, I'm going to change the title slightly of my presentation today. Uh, it will be uh, the uh, resistance, assimilation, re uh, uh, resistance, and the, I'll use the French word métissage. There's not really a good definition. There's not really a good translation into English of métissage. Uh, uh, in, in more, in a more general sense, it's translate. It could be translated as a kind of hybridization, a kind of mixing. The the, the word mestizo doesn't quite work because it's too biological. Uh, so I, I will use the, the, the of, uh, of Métissage, which the uh, Francophone authors uh, have also adopted in, in, in that broader sense of cultural uh, cultural mixing. So um, the uh, so it will be um, assimilation, resistance, and transformation. Let's call it French discourses. So I, I'm going to kind of present an intellectual history, a history of ideas. Uh, of the way the, the French themselves, or no, not the French, but French speakers uh, have tried to come to grips with their empire. Uh, and that's mostly going to be mostly from the perspective of African writers and, and Caribbean writers uh, and, and the writers of the diaspora. If you go to Paris today in some neighborhoods, you are at, in the French empire. Uh, the, the French wanted an empire. The empire is in Paris. Uh, so there's also a, a, a diaspora literature that's uh, in, uh, increasingly present in the French literary scene. So I'm going to look at French discourses, not only literature, anthropology, philosophy. Uh, there, we have more and more Af African philosophers, the, the Francophone African philosophers, who have or trying also to come to an understanding of their relationship uh, to the, the center. Uh, they've, they're from the periphery, and they've been working on uh, attempts to understand their position and the position of their cultures uh, in, 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 in the French Empire. So I'll just work on two general axes without going into details. I will mention a few authors, but because I, I think I should, because some of them really have uh, uh, written masterpieces uh, in French. Uh, in fact, I would say that in many ways, some of, the, some of the most vibrant French literature of the past 10 or 15 years, even more, has come from the periphery, uh, from Africa, and particularly from the Caribbean, from the, from the, from the Antilles. I use the term Antilles because uh, that's the way the, 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 the French use it. And I think we can still, I think we say it in English, like the Antilles. Or um, so on two axes. Well, one is um, 
Uh, there, in, in general, I think we can categorize these, these attempts uh, because writers, the, the, the French discourse has, has in, in a very large part worked on binaries uh, that Russell mentioned at the very beginning of, uh, of the conference. Uh, uh, the, the, the binaries that that, that characterize the, this, this literature uh, in, a, in a broad sense, that these French discourses try to um, deal with the relationship between universals and particulars, the general with the singular, modern and traditional, uh, or these days postmodern and traditional, and even most recently hyper modern and traditional, uh, uniformization uh, and, and the personal, the global and the local, totalized and the specific. So uh, those of you who have some familiarity with the French mode of expository thinking, uh, where generally we, there, there's been work on either one side of those binaries or the other, or more generally, and this is the French method uh, that, uh, that French students are taught, uh, you have your thesis and your antithesis and then your synthesis. So we, we will see that in general terms, in, in a synchronic fashion, uh, all of this literature uh, adopts this French rhetorical style. Uh, e even, of course, the, the elites from the periphery uh, who France brought to, to France well, one of the uh, one of the ironies of the the history of the French Empire is that France deliberately sought out the most talented uh, members of the periphery, brought them to France, brought them to Paris, to begin with, gave them the best education that France even gives its own best talent, uh, and and the, of course they 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 learn the French discursive method at the at the. Well, the not at, mostly not at French universities. You know, there's in, in France there's a separation between what the French call the Grande École, which really is prepares the future elite, and the university. Uh, so France brought uh, from the Caribbean, from Africa, uh, with, with, with the, the members of those communities that they identified as the, the most talented, the most promising political leaders, and indeed they did become uh, important political leaders. But they led the revolution and the resistance. Uh, to the to the French Empire, so France trained, educated its own uh, antithesis, its own resistance, in, in a very large measure. Um, so um, that's the, those are the binaries. That's the the the, the 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 general methodological framework. And, and now it, it's important to move it through time, uh, to, to to give that discursive style. Uh, a diachronic dimension. And most of the, I mean, the, the histories of French literature, uh, the French literature from the periphery, from the empire, uh, identify several phases. Uh, these phases are a phase of attempted assimilation uh, and, and, and views of the French empire from the point of view of the metropolitan center. Uh, this begins with the empires of the kings already in the 17th century. Uh, then we go through a phase of resistance, uh, then to this phase of mixing or metissage, and curiously, and this is where I'm going to end up, uh, we come back to a phase of assimil assimilation, uh, but assimilation at a different level. Uh, after having gone through a, a hybridization or a synthesis, of, uh, of those relationships between the, the center and the and the periphery, um, the, the 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 first literature, of course, is the literature of the explorers and the missionaries. A actually, French missionaries were the first ethnologists, uh, already beginning in the 17th century. So, some the, the first history of Guadeloupe, for example, for example, is by the you know Father Labat, the Père Labat. Uh, who had, wrote a multi-volume history of the society uh, in, in Guadeloupe, including the, the original indigenous uh, society uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the island. Uh, the same for Africa. Uh, we, the, the, the earliest anthropologists were missionaries who were attempting to understand 
African cultures and their religions in order to better, more effectively Christianize. But here, here we have an ambiguity. It's an interesting ambiguity because at one and the same time, they had a, there, there were many who had a real human, humane devotion, devotion uh, to the, to the, the, the Africans. And they attempted to understand uh, the, the African, I would say they were the first structuralists. Uh, trying to understand the structure of African beliefs, animist beliefs for the most part, uh, and partly Islam also, in order to better uh, Christianize the, these populations. Uh, uh, we encounter a lot of ambiguities uh, in, in, in this literature. So uh, that's, that's the first phase. And th 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 these phases overlap. We, we have the same approach, uh, the description from the point of view of the colonizer, uh, all throughout the different empires, the, 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 the royal empires, the, the empires of the different republics of, of France, uh, uh, up through, um, of course, in, including uh, today. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the approach of the, the, the point of view of uh, the, the colonizer, uh, uh, a, a lot of literature, for example, dealing with the West Indies, uh, is an exotic literature, uh, and the the, act, the the Caribbean authors uh, uh, refer back to an, an interesting essay by Victor Segalown, exot, exot, exotism with it. Uh, the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the Antilles authors uh, call this doo-doo literature because doo-doo is like, like a, a rough translation. It's like cute or charming. Uh, they, they see this as the, the projection of an attempt to find something exotic without actually penetrating uh, the, 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 the cultures of the, the, the West Indies, or, or, or for Africa, for, for that matter. So there, there is a reaction, particularly among uh, the colonized, against this sort of doo-doo literature, this, this, uh, this charming exot exotism. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, Part of this literature of assimilation, actually, in the early phases of colonization, the colonized uh, often accepted the hegemony, the cultural hegemony of, of France. And m many of the Africans saw themselves as French, uh, just simply French. Uh, and of course, the, the, the goal of the education of France was to make them French uh, and to, to, uh, to, 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 to turn them into Frenchmen, or to turn them into, into well, in, in some cases in the history of the Third Republic, to turn them into French citizens. Uh, you know that uh, in some some places of Africa, uh, uh, they, the, there was actual representation in the French National Assembly during the Third Republic, uh, uh, w w which was the case of many of the, the French leaders who, who, who later became the leaders of their own independent country. So, so uh, some of this literature accepted French hegemony, the French culture, the culture of the center. They just wanted to, to make the relationship better, more humane, less violent, uh, less aggressive. Their, their idea was to humanize this relationship while, while at the same time maintaining uh, their conception of, of being French. Uh, of course, there was a rejection of that, a reaction against that. And we get that first reaction, we get the, the most, the most of virulent reactions against that from these elites educated in France. They, they go to France uh, feeling that they're really visiting their mother country. I mean, you, you find that in the writing of not only the authors of Maghreb, but of, of, of Africa, but also of the, of the Caribbean. Uh, they feel like in some ways, intellectually, they're going home because they've, they've been already raised in the French Lycée in these countries, the Ecole the, the, the Weekend. They've already been raised. Uh, they've learned this literature. Of course, they're quickly disabused because when they arrive in Paris, because of the color of their skin, uh, they come up against all kinds of discrimination. So, so there's, there's a reaction against this, and they, uh, they react not completely against French civilization, the French intellectual trend, because they do adopt uh, currents of, of Western thought that are also critis, critical of the West. So of course, they quickly adopt Marxism, and surrealism, and Freud, 
Uh, that goes together, of course, with the surrealism because they're, they're, they're looking for something rather other than the Cartesian rationality to attempt to explain their position vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the metropolitan the metropolitan center. So one of the most, uh, one of the leading, where well, there were two leading scholars in this, who become very important political players later, uh, that's M.A. Cizaya, uh, whose very famous poem, uh, a surrealist poem, uh, written in the, uh, uh, and published in the 1930s, a return to a, my native land, uh, Retour au Pays Natal, uh, is, is still widely read, and it's extremely difficult poetry. Uh, uh, and the, the other is Leopold Sangor, Leopold Sangor, who uh, also adopts uh, these approaches, but Leopold Sangor, who's African, and who can rely on African traditions. The major, the major fracture here is between the Caribbean, where there is very little, there are very small vestiges, if anything, of their Af the previous African cultures. Whereas in Africa, the African uh, writers can, can draw on their their own indigenous, uh, their own indigenous cultures and intellectual traditions. And Leopold Senghor does that. Leopold Senghor tries to find something that's African uh, in in his uh, relationship to. To, to France, that's his attempted synthesis. Uh, of course, this rea the first reaction uh, 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 comes leads to the creation of an oppositional approach called negritude. Uh, the idea is that there's something about a African, there's something about a black culture, uh, a, a black soul, uh, an African soul that's fundamentally in opposition to the to the West. Um, the uh, 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 reaction against that from the next generation is that it's too totalizing. Jean-Paul Sartre also, yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the uh, negritude is rejected by the next generation because it's seen, it's seen as too totalizing. And we come back to a literature that tries to find roots in uh, uh, local cultures, be it Africa or the Caribbean. So, so now we have the literature of creolization, uh, trying to define a, a world, uh, a West Indian world, for example. And it's interesting to note here, this rejection of negritude uh, includes authors, one, one, one of the authors that the, the Caribbean writers uh, 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 accept is Saint-Jean Perse, who, who, who's the son of a plantation owner. Uh, they see they see purse as as as, as one of their own. Uh, the most recent literature of, of Metisage, and I'll just do this briefly, uh, is uh, uh, from anthropologists. Uh, well, there 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 are the the most interesting, I think, most recent work is by an anthropologist called Jean Louis Amsel, uh, who has who's gone beyond uh, an interpretation of Metisage and who views the relationship with, among all cultures, for that matter, uh, as what he calls branchement. Branchement in French means you plug in to a flow of, uh, of, ele of electrons. For Amsel, uh, what cultures are doing, and, and how anthropologists would understand culture, is, is, is connecting into a, 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 a dense uh, universe of signs, of, the sig of signifiers. So what he's saying is that uh, uh, Every culture adopts signifiers from the West, and the signify that they create signifiers that are specific to their own culture, but nevertheless have connected to the universe, these this universal signifiers. And just one other thing, because I wanted to mention this for Wayne. Now, Amsel uh, says that there are no what's what's dangerous about uh, Afrocentrism or any kind of centrism is, is that there that there are traditions that are created to try to find origins. And to the extent that creating origins is trying to find some sort of cultural purity, he sees this as dangerous. He tries to explain the genocides of Africa in the past 20 years from this. To the extent that there's an attempt to create an original, pure culture, the ultimate defense of that pure culture is a violent defense of that, uh, of that culture. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to other things later. But, I, I didn't mean to include my personal presentation as part of the presentation. But. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
So uh, our next speaker is then Silvana Kandolanda from the University of Haifa, and she'll be speaking, um, her title is Between Center and Periphery in the Libyanist Bussel Debate, A Philosophy of Otherness or a Practice of Liberation from Imperialism. The Argentinian philosopher and theologian Enrique Dussel was one of the many young South American intellectuals who had studied in Europe during the 60s. And that experience uh, fostered in them a process of discovering their own Latin American identity. Dussel will describe it uh, as, I wished uh, passionately to go to Europe and going toward it, I had discovered forever the peripheral world that had been until then beyond my horizon. This process will uh, give birth to what was later known as uh, the philosophy of liberation, being uh, Dussel, one of its uh, founders, and the most prominent exponent, uh, together with uh, Juan Carlos Scanone, the Argentinian priest who discovered, who brought uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, the, the Jewish, uh, Lithuanian, French philosopher, into Latin America. Dussel and Scanone, they, they finished their studies in Europe and came back to, to Argentina, and in uh, 1970, uh, with, together with a group of uh, young uh, university teachers, they, they organized a seminar of philosophy uh, in, in a first attempt of uh, trying to articulate uh, philosophical foundations for, for their, their intuitions. And uh, following Scanone's uh, advice, they, they started to, to study Levinas' book, Totality and Infinity, an essay on exteriority, Nine, nine years uh, after its first publication in 1961. Dussel will uh, later say or write about this moment of revelation in these words. <clears throat> when I first read Levinas' book, Totality and Infinity, I deeply felt a subversive derangement de 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 of everything I had learned until then. Under this strong impression, a year later, Dussel traveled again to Europe and met with Levinas in two significant uh, meetings in uh, 71 and 72 in Paris and Louvain. Those meetings would repeatedly be mentioned in many of uh, his future works, and, uh, although with uh, some contradictions in the details. Levinas will, will also re recall these meetings more than a decade after in an interview uh, in, uh, in uh, 84, when he was asked about the attempt that had been made, especially in Latin America, to establish a synthesis of his philosophy and Marxism, Levinas responded. I knew Enrique Dussel, who used to quote me a lot, and who is now much closer to political, even geopolitical thought. Moreover, I have gotten to know a very sympathetic group of South Americans working out the liberation philosophy, Scanone in particular. We had a meeting here with Bernard Casper, a friend of mine, who is a professor of theology at Freeburg and some Catholic philosophers from South America. There is a very interesting attempt in South America to return to the spirit of the people. Moreover, there is a great influence on, of Heidegger in the manner, the rhythm, of developing topics and in the radicalism of the questioning. And Levinas said, I am very happy, very proud even, when I hear the echoes of my work in this group. This is a fundamental approval. It means that other people have also seen the same thing. And in these words, we can feel both the proximity and the distance that characterizes the influence of Levinas' work in, the, in the, this nascent trend, new trend of liberation philosophy. And some scholars will say that the, the influence was also a, a other way around, that the Levinas was also influenced by the Latin Americans, but it's, it still needs a further in investigation. Dussel, on whom we are focusing, found in Levinas' conception of totality the theoretical foundation for his enterprise of rethinking South America. However, their paths began to split when Dussel turned to think about how to translate this philosophy into real politics, while Levinas aimed, at, at, at least in this book, is to, to remain, to, to rethink and, and to renew metaphysics and not politics. 
And what is this theoretical foundation provided by Levinas? Levinas understands totality as a, an ontological imperialism, as a, the assimilation of all alterity into the sameness of the self, the eradication of all differences. And in his words, the relation with being that is enacted as ontology consists in neutralizing the existence in order to comprehend and grasp it. It is hence not a relation with the other as such, but the reduction of the other to the same. Such is the definition of freedom, to maintain oneself against the other, despite every relation with the other to ensure the outer key of the eye. Thematization and conceptualization, which moreover are inseparable, are not peace with the other, but suppression or possession of the other. For possession affirms the, the other, but within a negation of its independence. I think comes down to I can, to an appropriation of what is, to an exploitation of reality. And then he would say, um, it, it issues in the state and in the non-violence of the totality without securing itself against the violence from which this non-violence lives and which appears in the tyranny of the, of the state. And he says, uh, universality will be uh, in, in, person, in, in personality and another kind of in, inhumanity. By this reduction of the other to the same, totality neutralizes the existence and brings to a situation of domination. Our understanding of freedom is based on this ontological imperialism. The other is for Levinas, the absolutely other, a complete stranger that escapes my grasp and any possibility of domination by me. And this, this will be a, a point of distinction between Levinas, for whom the other is absolutely other, and Dussel, which says that is a tragic mistake to, to refer to the other as absolutely other. To, to introduce individuality into universality generates an act of dehumanization. So, and that is why a universe, a ontological imperialism is, uh, which is embodied in the states, uh, in the state and in politics as, as totalizing the systems, uh, is, is a imperialism. And it's uh, what he calls a permanent state of war. Politics as a state of, of permanent war. Uh, but he will say that he, he, doesn't, he doesn't stay in the state of war, he, he finds a way to break this totality in the face-to-face uh, -face encounter. Uh, Levinas wants to, to point a, a deeper level in which metaphysics relies. It is the primary level of uh, the I who, who, by going toward the other in desire and goodness, experiences the fertility of being. And that is what Levinas calls peace. It's the peace of uh, the I going towards the other uh, and, and uh, in, in, a, in a situation of fertility. Uh, three elements from Levinas metaphysics uh, will be taken by Dussel. The radical and well-articulated criticism of Western philosophy that Dussel thought he found in, in Levinas, although it is not clear, it's not, it's doubt, doubtful if uh, it was Levinas' intention to so hardly criticize a, a philosophy, but Dussel found it in him, exemplified in Hegel, Dussel, and Heidegger as a philosophy of totality, domination, and imperialism. The suggestion, too, the suggestion of a new metaphysics of alterity based on my ethical obligation toward the other. And three, the reaffirmation of the self, self, Dussel would say, a cultural self. Uh, identity as the first step for liberation. From now on, not only could Levinas' metaphysics of alterity be applied to individuals, but to, to the exteriority of third world peoples, nations, and cultures marginalized by the history of, by the history of, of the world as well. And the, the vibrant imperative to politicize ontology, as Dussel calls it, Dussel will move from individual ethics to an ethical, historical as of a people project of liberation. The philosophy of liberation, of, of which 
Dussel, as I said, uh, is one of the, the reference, was the last matrix of uh, several local trends of thought that started to emerge in the 60s and the early 70s in Latin America as a reaction against extremely delicate political and socioeconomic situation in, in Latin American countries. Uh, as uh, United States uh, interventionist politics, um, internal political instability, and the uh, succession of the uh, caps de that uh, interrupted the democratic processes, political violence, and the uh, in increasing poverty and inequality. And uh, in this uh, turbulent context, uh, and, and still very much after the the influence, the effect of uh, the Cuban Revolution of uh, '59. And, uh, and a very, very violent uh, cap de that uh, in, in Argentina in '66. Um, all all this provoked a, a, a radicalization of the Latin American thinking, uh, bringing uh, uh, the, the the traditional left, which is uh, communist and socialist, together with with the populist, the Peronist which is the, the party of uh, General Juan Domingo Perón uh, that were not not uh, left or, or not communist, but they also engaged together in a, in a very anti-imperialistic and, uh, and, and uh, pro-revolution messages. And uh, the Argentinian intellectuals so took the, the Sartre's imperative on the author's commitment uh, as uh, being those who have to break the the boy, become the voice of those who don't have a voice, and Enrique Dussel was one of them. Although Dussel repeatedly mentions how grateful he is with Levinas for providing him with the basic philosophical concepts of which on which pillars he has constructed his building, he also likes to constantly remark that there are a huge there is a huge uh, difference between them. In a book called Latin American Liberation Theology and Emmanuel Levinas, published in 75, he goes back to the encounter in Paris and, and tells it from, from his side. He says, while speaking with Levinas in Paris at the beginning of 71, I could verify the degree of similarity of our thinking with that of the French philosopher. But, but at the same time, uh, the radical rapture that already then had occurred. He told me how the great political experiences of his generation had been the presence of Stalin and Hitler to uh, dehumanizing totalizations, fruit of the European Hegelian modernity. But by indicating that not only the great experience of my generation, but of the last half millennium has been the ego of European modernity, the conqueror and the colonialist ego imperial in its culture and oppressor of the peoples of the periphery, he could not help to accept that he had never thought that the other author could be an Indian, an African, or an Asian. The other of totality, or the European world, were all cultures and men who had been constituted as things at hand, hand instrument, uh, non-ideas, non like the, now it's a, it was Europe, now it's Russia and America. Um, and and he, he continues, as a, another quote, uh, Levinas, as a Jewish thinker, could find in, it, in his existential experience a point of exteriority that enabled him to criticize totality, of uh, the totality of European thinking. But, and that's it, that was interesting, on the other hand, he had not suffered Europe in its totality, and its holding point was still Europe itself. While we Latin Americans, Africans, and Asians have suffered Europe uh, probably. Uh, so be, um, beyond the question about the veracity of the, the testimony, I think it's quite strange to, to accuse someone who, who has spent five years in a camp of prisoners of war during World War II and who has lost, lost his, his family in the Holocaust of uh, not having suffered Europe in its totality. He, he's, uh, he, there is here a, a, maybe a, 
trying to, uh, to appropriate uh, the monopoly of oppression or, or suffering. And it's, this is the thing that the Dussel was, was accused of, um, together with Latin American philo philosophers, that this is the kind of hybrids of uh, uh, the, we, we, we are, we peripheral thinkers are the one, the only one who, who know what suffer is, and uh, no European or Northern can, can understand it. Um, and, but, uh, and he, he, the Dussel points this uh, very clearly in, uh, in the, the European uh, being, being not able to, not being able to, to break with totality. And he says the difference between, uh, between Latin Americans or peripheral and European thinkers is the, the European thinks that there are two kinds of societies. One society is the uh, actual society, and the other is the, the ideal and reachable society. And Latin Americans, comes with it. there are three kinds. It's the actual bad society, there is the messianic uh, ideal society, and there is a society which can be liberated now. So it's a possible that, that exists. Um, so I, I, to, to, I think that this difference of uh, Dussel trying to, to create the theoretical basis uh, for, for a new politics, rather than uh, Levinas trying to, to uh, rise up the primal ethical claim of, of the other beyond or before politics, is due to their uh, to, to their uh, geographical presence, but also with the, their, their religious and, and the substantial uh, conception, Dussel being a Christian a believer, very strong Christian believer, and, and uh, Levinas coming from a, from a Jewish uh, background. Um, I, I think they, they, they complement and, and, and the also are very separate. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gideon Russo, uh, Northwest University, South Africa. Uh, this paper is entitled, Rose Must Fall, Poverty, Property of Power, The Imperial Legacy of Constitutional Narrative of Closer South Africa. Hi, good morning. <coughs> I would like to thank uh, Telos for inviting me, and I've learned a tremendous amount from the other speakers. And uh, my paper starts with uh, Rhodes. Cecil John Rhodes was the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony. He had arrived in, in the Cape Colony in 1870 and had uh, gone into diamond trade, and by 1888 he had gained control of the De Beers Mine Diamond Monopoly. A company which still till today, except for the Australian pink diamonds, still have a monopoly on, on, on all diamond trade. Uh, he was at the height of the British Empire, and in his world, which also created the Rhodes Scholarships, he wrote that the Anglo Saxon race was the first race in the world, and the more of the world that we can settle, the better for the human race. He also had a secret, a secret society. Uh, earlier, it's not in his final world, in which he had foreseen that not only the Holy Land and Australia and Africa, but also, he says, the entire South America should be taken by this Anglo-Saxon British race for the betterment of the world. My paper, which I will probably not succeed in covering in 15 minutes, I look at the issues on pre-colonialism, then colonialism and the trade of diamonds, the gold in the South African Union, becoming an industrial state, and then apartheid and the Cold War, because the, the, the specter of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union uh, and uh, uh, the liberation struggles cut out over us in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Then we had Mandela and the Rainbow Nation and, and the transformation South Africa experience, which is in many ways remarkable. And then I engage with what are the foundational myths of, of a society and how does the ideas of modernity and enlightenment and nationalism actually find and also not find its existence in, in Africa and in, in the developing world and in South Africa. Then I deal with the 
roads must fall, hashtag, hashtag roads must fall, uh, uh, protests from the student movement uh, starting in 2015. We started with the first excrement being thrown at the statue of Rhodes, which was on the University of Cape Town premises. The Rhodes had donated all the land and a lot of the money for the University of Cape Town. And then uh, the difficulty with the university management engaging with a, a almost amorphous student protest movement which then ultimately ended up with a level of chauvinism and then essential, essentialism and engaging in the kind of uh, racism that we spoke about, about purity. And then the bigger question is, what is the nature of law and democracy and how can we, as in South Africa, but also as an example of a complex society, bring this together in a, a system of law and justice? And there I look at Distribution and recognition in, in developing the ideas around justice. South Africa is, is a very complex society, and our origins, in a sense, go back a, a long way. And if we start with pre colonial Africa, about which there is not much knowledge, and I'm certainly not much qualified to speak about it. And because it's oral culture and oral tradition, there is not that much information, and it needs to be. Research and certainly the university systems, when we were confronted with the uh, Rose Moscow protests, had to acknowledge that we have not, in fact, as people who develop and produce and bring knowledge, have not actually engaged very successfully in relation to pre colonial African identities. South Africa is, is complex because, in a sense, we started, uh, it starts with the Portuguese Empire uh, reaching out, trying to get around Africa. Bartholomew Dias uh, accidentally stumbled, stumbled, stumbled over Cape Town. He called it Cabo das Tormentas because it was it has terrible weather. But when the Portuguese king heard about it, he was so happy he changed it to uh, Cabo de Boa Esperanza, Cape of Good Hope. But he didn't experience the weather in Cape Town when he, when he said that. There was also then the Portuguese viceroy in 1510 who had a run in with the Koi Koi and was actually killed in, 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 in a battle with the Koi Koi. The difficulty around First Nations discourses in South Africa is that only the Koi, and there's big debates about that, uh, uh, there are now writers who say that the term Khoi San is an incorrect, the term that the whites used in relation to these people, I won't say because it's not considered pejorative. So there are big debates about who is Khoi, who is Khoi San, and who are then in fact the First Peoples, and then the Nguni, the African people, were also migrating into, into the southern part of Africa. So one can have very unproductive debates who was, who, who was where first. So I, I tend not to get into that debate because it's not that actually useful to answer the questions about how are we going to go from here. But the fact is that we have this complex history starting with the Portuguese and then the Dutch and then the British. But in some ways, I, I like starting, also because I also teach international trade law in my other existence, I, I like starting with the book Mare Liberum by Grotius, Sifkuta Kruet, one of the founding fathers of Roman Dutch law, which is important in our legal system. And Mare, Mare Liberum is the freedom of the seas, written in 1609. And it was a dispute between the Dutch and the Portuguese. Because the Portuguese had their adoption of Mare Clausum, of the closed sea. And, and the, the embryonic uh, colonial states of the time were trying to claim the sea in the same way as land. So what would happen is uh, all the famous explorers that you, you, you'd heard about were basically just pirates with a pirate flag. So you would come across another ship full of laden, full of benefits from the East Indies, and you would capture them on the basis that they were sailing in your sea. And you would basically steal their stuff and then sell them in, in, in your marketplace. So uh, you could read Grotius in writing at the start of the notion of international law, saying that the sea is, in a sense, uh, like the air. It is, in fact, open to everybody. You cannot trespass in the, in, in the, open, sea, in the open sea, and that each, every nation is free to travel to other nations and trade with it. So this innocent right of passage at sea is then central to, to international law, but also enabling lawful, and I put that in quotation marks, colonial mm -hmm. exploitation, because the sea belongs to, to everybody and not to a particular nation that can claim control of it. The 
the, uh, the Cape was settled by the Dutch East India Company, the DOC. So that was not settled by the Dutch government. It was settled by, by, by a company for its uh, economic purposes. But then we became a, a place where, where migrants came, where refugees came. My own family came to, uh, the forebears came as French Huguenots after the relocation of the Edith of Nantes and uh, Protestants had to flee France. And some came just to Southern Africa. And over the, uh, and we gave the world the word, the word refugee. Uh, over the next few hundred years, uh, and I make the distinction between colonialism and the impact of colonialism and the notion of migration, because there is the impact, the negative impact of colonialism, but also the reality of people through centuries migrating and seeking, seeking better lives elsewhere. And I think it's important to distinguish between the impact of the colonial and state colonialism as, and, and distinguish that from the needs of people to find a life of their own. Because Africa has been the refuge of, of many refugees, then with the complication that the refugees and other migrants arriving then having benefits in relation to the indigenous population and become part of that exploitation, exploitation process. There's also the issue of slavery, which in South Africa public discourse is not sufficiently regarded. So people were owned as things, uh, starting with Indonesian and, and uh, African slaves, and that has very much shaped. There were more slaves in the 18th century in the Cape Colony than, than citizens, and uh, this issue was then interestingly changed. The British uh, took the Cape, which it was taking its trade route to India because Napoleon had first had uh, won a war and then had. To, Report and escaped, and uh, he then went on to being captured again. So we became British. The British then abolished slavery in 1833, which caused the Boer, the Dutch speaking populations, to, to flee into the inland and uh, to uh, then meet up and then have complex interactions with the indigenous people, uh, sometimes with agreements, sometimes with violence, and then leading to the discovery of first diamonds and gold. The British Empire itself then became much more interested in pursuing uh, this uh, extractive capitalism. So at the beginning of or the end of the ninth, uh, 19th century, one has the World War when the British tried to recapture the gold on the basis of protecting their citizens who had come to Johannesburg and other mining cities for wealth. But also part of Cecil John Rhodes' vision of a railway line from Cape to Cairo, the thinking that uh, painting the entire map of Africa pink and claiming it for Britain. We also then had uh, indentured labourers brought from India. So, with very complex history, complex problems around how we all interact. One of the consequences of the World War was the immense poverty of the white population whose farms were destroyed, who had been in concentration camps for, uh, created by Lord Kitchener. <coughs> and so much so that in 1929, uh, there was the, the first Carnegie inquiry into white poverty. So we also look at, at uh, colonialism, one had to look at surplus populations and very much poor working class people pushed out of Europe and refugees who are making their way across the world and then are competing with indigenous populations. South Africa then, mostly because of the Second War, Second World War uh, had the capacity to industrialize also on the basis of gold and diamonds. And then we had, in 1948, the creation of apartheid, where it was uh, the, the hierarchy of races was strictly uh, put in law. And when the rest of the world was celebrating a, a defeat of racism, we were embarking upon an exacerbation of races, with a split hierarchy of, of races. And uh, the liberation movements in Africa under the protection of the Soviet Union and China to some extent in the 60s uh, as liberation movements were working. Uh, uh, Harold Macmillan spoke in our parliament about the winds of change blowing across Africa. South Africa was resisting that. But uh, then once again, we get back to the Portuguese. The Carnation Revolution in 1974 in Portugal uh, when the Portuguese fascist regime uh, was uh, collapsed, immediately led to Mozambique and Angola being given up, and there were civil wars in both of those. But that enabled the liberation movements of foothold right on South African borders, 
and the intensification of the of the of the liberation struggle and this the, the militarization of the South African state. And someone like myself as a white conscript would have been required to, to fight in, in that in that war. And yeah, the, the the next major event was the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the end of the Cold War, the end of the Soviet Empire actually meant that the the discussions around democratizing South Africa could take place in, to some extent free from these imperial forces, which then led to uh, the, uh, the uh, free, free of Nelson Mandela, and then a uh, very interesting time, not, uh, the, the, the notion of a nation, a rainbow nation, a slightly shallow myth, but also the, trans, uh, the TRC process, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where to a limited extent people had to confess the wrongs that had been done and received pardon if they had committed those violent acts for, uh, for, for political purposes. The, 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 the TRC is a whole debate which I, I can't go into here. Yeah, it probably was not that, wasn't pushed through to a its logical conclusion. So we have now the notion of a nation state and then we are struggling how to how to live together as this complex nation of different colors, different races, different histories. And the, the, the reality painted in our beer commercials of happy young men drinking together and enjoying sport probably does not reflect any kind of truth of our actual existence. We have made, I think, significant progress in certainly abandoning formal racial discrimination but the, the remnants, the residue of, of, of the white supremacy that I was raised with, that needs to be needs to be fixed. Our constitution is a lovely liberal and post-liberal document, and then the issue is, is that a sufficient document on which to base the integration of such a complex nation? Uh, Homi Baba writes that the narrative of the nation starts with the forgetting, but I'm not sure that that is the useful way. I think my view is that one should remember and acknowledge as the basis for going forward. But uh, my, in looking at my students, looking at, at young South Africans of all races, we have a culture of consumerism, a culture of not knowing history, of not engaging with history. And the, the distribution of financial wealth has not moved to a significant extent in the past 25 years. And this is then the, the born freeze, as we call them, those who were born after 1990, now going to university, some of them having been to good schools, having been, um, in a sense, some of the French students uh, being citizens of, of a free country, then running into the reality of the, the differential of power and the reality of, of that the wealth is concentrated in a particular particular sense of uh, same hand. And yeah, how one engages with that. The the fees must fall and the roads must fall movement then started out in a sense in my view as a kind of populist backlash. And I use Darendorf's uh, well end on this Darendorf's <laughs> discussions about populism because populism simplifies. Populism is, is is simplistic whereas democracy is complex. So what is required is, is, is engagement on the basis of informed uh, uh, social engagement. And Darnoff writes that learning to live with complexity is maybe the most important task of democratic education. And in my experience, and I think our reality is that we have not done that. So we are running the risks of populist movements with essentialism, who are then express uh, in racist terms the, the Rosemary's Fall movement to some extent and become quite chauvinist, uh, quite anti-women, but also uh, violence. And then in Italy, immense violence erupted. And my university's Adam building was burnt down as part of the protest. Artwork was destroyed at UCT. And yeah, so, so we, we are in, a sense, in need of the next step past the Rainbow Nation. And that is not so easy to achieve in my data is an effort to try to engage with that. So our final paper uh, is presented by Denise Valenzuela Premier uh, at the Catholic University of Toulouse, Chile. Uh, instead of the title is Ideology, Political Order, and the House. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, marvelous being here with uh, all of you. It's a rather rich experience. The background to... Uh, I can't kiss. Oh, I guess I'll have to use this. 
Okay, is this on now? Is it on now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, background uh, to my concern for the questions of something uh, on ideology is to do with my own personal experience. And uh, in, uh, I was in June, when I was uh, in 9 and 10, and this thing called the military coup happened. And as a child, I saw things that normally sh children shouldn't see. And I started asking myself questions about what, what are the motivations that people have to engage in this sort of type of regime. And uh, later on in life, I went to university and started asking questions about, well, what are the nature of ideas? What do people do to, uh, to do such things? And uh, uh, what is power? So this is like sort of background to this. Let's get right into it. The relevance of ideology in the study of international politics, politics is perhaps more significant now than ever before. After the rise of the Soviet system of the Cold War, we bear witness to a steadfast economic, political, political and military expansion of Western interests throughout international society. This conference's principal theme, the endurance of empire, would seem to confirm the uh, ongoing concern in certain quarters over what such events mean and their implications for the future of a culturally diverse global system. This expansion is unsurprisingly uh, accompanied by a self-serving discourse that offers the world no escape from the imperatives of an ideology that seeks to graft upon the world a particular view of domestic and international order. In this respect, I posit that it is the power of ideas, as well as material power, uh, that is the uh, cornerstone of any political order. Whether we speak of what one scholar has called the imperial humanism of the Renaissance, which unleashed the history of the Spanish Empire, or of the German National Socialist Weltanschauung, which in turn proffered its own view of European order, it had been such ideas or ideologies that formed the point of departure for the development of history. It's impossible to cover the breadth, uh, cover here the breadth of the literature on the meaning of ideology is a concept. However, uh, it is possible to state here simply that ideology, as a term coined by the French philosopher uh, Antoine de Scoutetrecy in his work, The Elements of Ideology, this is the era of the Enlightenment, pointed to the task of arriving at a scientific understanding of the nature of the mind, the nature of the human being, in an attempt at determining the proper uh, character of the society in which people should live. Uh, one historian said the general happiness so eagerly sought during the Enlightenment could be ensured by the correct engineering of government and society. Ideology, or the science of ideas, would attempt to offer a scientific explanation of the manner in which human thoughts are formed, and in doing so, illuminate the path to true knowledge of human nature, and therewith the means of defining the general laws of sociability. From the perspective of politics, this rational or scientific outlook of the Enlightenment had immediate consequences for the development of ideas related to domestic and foreign policy, as well as repercussions for the development of political ideas later in the 19th century. The charges leveled against the society of the old regime had also become the vehicles of dynastic uh, of criticism of dynastic foreign policy. One may look no further uh, than to the physical facts and physical philosophers. For an illustration of this, the latter, scornful of the diplomacy of the ancien regime, saw the result of the resolution of the problem of war as a function of the establishment of an ideal state. And this necessarily involved a radical transformation of both the state and society. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead because I have a feeling that uh, I'm not going to be able to finish this. Let's go directly to the question of foreign policy. There was a long, way long version of this, about 16,000 words. So anyone wants to get into it, here I am. Within the context of foreign policy coalition, one may make the case that ideologies constitute belief systems that hypothetically shape decision maker perception, politically and socially, in an a priori manner, and govern to a greater or lesser degree the character of what Robert Jervis. International relations uh, academic called the psychological review of the policy maker, i.e., his worldview and his perception, interpretation, and definition of foreign policy events 
energy foreign, uh, uh, foreign policy to the process itself, uh, Goldstein and Cohen have similarly maintained ideas help to order the world, and by ordering the world, ideas shape agendas, which can profoundly shape outcomes. Insofar as ideas put blinders on people, reducing the number of conceivable alternatives, they serve as an invisible switchman, not only by turning action onto certain tracks rather than others, but also by obscuring uh, uh, the other tracks from the agent's view. At the state level, in turn, and in respect of uh, the sources of domestic, uh, domestic sources of policy, various elite interest groups uh, exert influence over uh, foreign policy formation. Gabriel Almond early on noted this in his account of the role of political bureaucratic communications in various elite interest groups in the creation of policy itself. More recently, Ripsman suggests that states, in fact, quote, must take into account the demands of powerful political actors, such as the military, economic elites, and even occasionally the public as a whole. My conceptualization of elites follows these assumptions, but also suggests that uh, elites constitute, more specifically, uh, um, a, a kind of social power that C. Wright Mills uh, referred to when he suggested that, quote, the power elite is composed of men whose position enabled them to transcend the ordinary environments of ordinary men and women. They are in positions to make decisions having major consequences. He saw the sources of social power as stemming uh, from the economic, military, and political spheres. Similarly, Franz Neumann, Franz Neumann, Frankfurt School, lesser known figure in Frankfurt School, conceived of power as social power focused on the state and state institutions as a means of directing its behavior according to a particular conception of national order held by ruling groups. From this, it follows that interest, uh, the interest groups or a constitutive element of national power, which influence government and the making of national and foreign policy by employing not only material interests, but also the ideological interests linked to them. In Hurrell's account of Henry Bull's thinking of the role of ideas in international relations, he maintains similarly that for Bull, both ideas mattered to the extent that they are taken up and acted upon by powerful states. And the relevance of particular norms and institutions would always be linked to the underlying distribution of material power. To this extent, my conception of state power is both material and social. Power not only implies mere material capabilities and resources, but also the power of influence over the decision-making apparatus and the attendant projection of interest into or onto the international system. As Gu Davies, he was a, he was a Oxford was principally a British diplomat. Two ladies put it, uh, power and ideology may even be mutually enforcing. Uh, Six and a half. Six and a half. Let's see. All right, jump ahead again. <laughs> Power of social material establish, uh, establishes political standards of international legitimacy, constructs zones and your uh, alliance systems among ideologically convergent states, and determines the nature of friend or foe. More to the point, I contend that powers or ideological policies operate within the global milieu in a distinctive manner towards other states, as Gould Davies, uh, Davies himself rightly maintained. Ideological states attempt to replicate aspects of their domestic system within other states. They define security in terms of the expansion of their domestic system and threat in terms of the expansion of their adversaries, adversaries of their domestic system. One resolution receives, uh, to receive security threats against this is the construction of ideological international orders conducive to doctrinal uniformity or homogeneity between ideologically convergent states and other ideologically distant states within the international system. Security, however, is, is not the only concern pertinent to the foreign policy agenda of states uh, that uh, see it fit or necessary to expand their domestic system. The purveyors and sources of policy from within the elite structure of states may see expansion not merely in terms of security, but as a functional necessity of the various internal social, political, and economic dynamics and elite interests 
that make expansion a requisite policy for the maintenance, uh, the maintenance of, uh, of uh, uh, the social system of uh, a particular ideology. Expansion and systemic reproduction, hence, uh, might be a function of perceived security as well as a requirement for extended opportunities of, for example, affluence or other benefits, uh, benefits that accrue from enlargement. This means in practice making, quote, international order, quote, itself a function of ideological imperatives and of the projection of social power within the international system, which as concrete policy may ch challenge established and broadly accepted norms that regulate international intercourse. For the late uh, in the school scholar of international relations, Martin White, this meant that an ideological power might cast a brand of, quote, revolutionism that, quote, demands homogeneity among the members of international society. It requires doctrinal and structural conformity and ideological homogeneity between states, oh, quote. This imperative, which is an effort to assimilate international relations into domestic politics, here, uh, there emerges a kind of universal foreign policy articulated and formulated in the interest of perhaps a perceived world civilization whose interests must be defined and pursued by a power or alternatively a group of powers. Intervention becomes a distinctive uh, feature of foreign policy in the transformation of the domestic uh, order of states. Uh, this is uh, consistent with Michael S. Wesley's account of the new interventionism in the post-Cold War age, it argues that efforts at the homogenization of the state system involves or involve the provision of prescriptive, uh, prescriptive advice about or the direct manipulation of a state's domestic processes and institutions of government, backed by the threat or the use of coercive measures or conditions on assistance by external states or international agencies. I would add, however, that the legitimation of both essential features of the ideological power's own domestic system, as well as of the policies required for uh, their extension beyond its frontiers, become a chief goal of uh, public discourse. How much time do I have left now? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I can do this. Martin White's conceptual, uh, conceptualization of the great revolution of state holds that, quote, the bearer. Uh, an exemplar of the new order and its relations with the unregenerate society of states will reproduce the relations of the church militant with the secular and infidel world, unquote. To the extent that this is true, this involves casting aside the tradition of tolerance, if there ever was one, and the ordering principles and opinion in the international relations that are at least a set, ostensibly a legacy of the Westphalian order, if and why. As White put it, international society exists by virtue of a core of shared values and standards embodied in part of international law, and if the tranquility of that society rests upon an even distribution of power among its members, then ideological challenges to the order of international society mean providing the occasion for subverting and sacrificing the principles of coexistence by virtue of stock of ideological tenets and requirements that submits its cause to the realm of necessity and expediency. Ideological orders, I, I argue, uh, may see fit to appeal to the methods of reason of state, which as Francisco Bucciardini many centuries ago famously maintained, represented the knowledge and power, I might add, necessary for the establishment, maintenance, and expansion of the state. Similarly, ideological orders embody the ethos of the Italian ragione di Stato, in a greater and enlarged sense by attempting to create an interstate leviathan uh, composed of ideologically convergent or compliant states that extol a new reason of system. Uh, I think I got, I stole that from Alan Cassell. So I don't want to attribute that to myself, but it is interesting. Ideological orders then. Uh, represent a spatial dominance of a particular political and so, uh, particular political and social arrangements brought to fruition by social and material forces that justify and legitimize such dominance on the basis of the progressive or beneficial uh, traits of the arrangements articulated by ideology itself. Go we'll finish. So the ideological dimension of international relations is 
significant because it potentially delivers uh, clues about state policies and clues about the kind of foreign policy about part of certain states in the pursuit of objectives within the international system. It posits additional variables to use social scientific language to explore and weigh against each other when, subje uh, when subjecting foreign policy, uh, the foreign policy process and outcomes to critical examination. And so it transforms the study of power politics, power politics, and the parallel inquiry into the ideas that motivate political action in the politics of the international. That's it. strong identity with uh, France today, even though the British took over and became part of Canada. Canada requires both languages, uh, uh, English and French, to learn about us, all the students in Canada. So, and yet, you got to need. So that's my question to you for the third speaker of uh, uh, the the uh, legalization uh, or the illegalization, the end of uh, slavery, was actually 1830, not 1833 for England. Uh, and for the Dutch uh, East Indies, and probably for the Hudson Bay Company for the British and for the that was the age of mercantilism where nationalism and the companies were very closely combined, actually. Uh, and their port requirements, sales requirements, uh, selling to the home front, uh, I think special relationships below it uh, for uh, companies. And so there really wasn't much of a divide between uh, uh, companies and countries uh, in, in that mercantilistic era. And so, so with the mercantilism and the read up. So, uh, we're going to just take some of these. Can you do that? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. Wonderful panel. And my, my question is inspired, first instance, by Solana's great paper. And I think might have potential relevance across for whoever might like to comment. And it starts with that great line from Levinas about ontology being the philosophy of power, which almost in my listening to the papers could almost be argued as a kind of underlying foundation for the whole discussion. Because you're talking about metaphysics and politics, it's like where metaphysics meets politics is where it determines how the different dynamics of power are going to play out. And so my question is, is this, how did Giselle respond to someone like Fanon, who with that, you know, those dynamics of power in mind, kind right, of said, hey look, the level of dehumanization in the circumstances under which we are living is such that only violence is going to get it done. So, you know, you can talk about the face, I don't mean in any respect to be flippant, but just kind of to, for rhetorical purposes, one can talk about the face to face encounter all they wish, but at the end of the day, it is violence, given the circumstances and the dynamics of power under which we live. What would the response be? I don't know if Giselle did engage with Fanon, or what would the response be? And I don't know if, if Steve and, and Vivian and Luis, if, if you guys think that question of Fanon and violence has any relevance for the discussions as well. Uh, it's a question for Gideon. Obviously, you didn't quite get enough time to talk about the Rose Moss Ball uh, campaign in detail. But obviously, you mentioned it's populist. And it's the opposite to dealing with the complexity of the historical legacy that's pretty mixed up. But the other uh, event that's happening is the in the US with regards to the statues of Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy flag. So there's you know in various parts of the world battles over the politics of historical mm -hmm. memory. So my question is whether you see there to be any merit whatsoever in the symbolic removal of statues and iconography that very directly relates to previous colonial or imperial or power skewed power dynamic regimes that, that clearly lead to human suffering, or not. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, 
Yeah, thank you, and thank you for your presentations. Enjoyed them very much. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, Louise. Uh, um, fantastic paper. Um, I, I thought if you uh, have been also relating your uh, points to this new, or not new, but this uh, uh, ideas, uh, epistemic communities that, that have been discussed, for instance, in Journal of International Organization. Because I think, uh, and maybe further out to uh, the concept of social power, uh, uh, this, if, if you have if you could elaborate on that, and if I speak, I have a, a question about uh, the last phase of your uh, historical narrative, so to say. Uh, it's about, uh, you, you, you said that in the last phase, we have a new form of assimilation. Uh, uh, and uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that, and also maybe uh, related to the particular situation in France after uh, 2015, the state of exception, or whatever we could call it. So that's that much. Okay. Yes, so, please, please be brief. The question of the violence is a huge question. Uh, Levinas is not an, an anarchist. He is not against uh, politics and against the uh, state, but he says uh, states and politics will always be violent because it, it, of its being a totalizing system. It's inevitable. So it will be violent. So we, we have to to, uh, to to remain in the metaphysical uh, uh, sphere, which is before or, or beyond the the politics. And, and I, I think it's, uh, it's due to, to Levinas' uh, Jewish uh, way of thinking, which uh, is he wants to remain in, in history, but with, uh, outside history also. He, want, he wants to be with a foot on, on history and with a foot uh, out of history. And it's, it's very, it's, it will be the uh, Luther's critique of him. If you are in history, so get engaged in liberation processes. If you are not, so don't talk about politics and don't don't, don't pretend to to try to uh, repair the world. Um, but Levinas uh, definitely won't be in both in both places. Uh, so so Dussel would say also that the violence is, is necessary as a response of the violence of imperialism. Uh, but he will say uh, we will have to have a violence at the beginning and uh, at, uh, until another totality, any new, system, new political system that we will be, uh, build will be uh, violent. And that is why he, he will um, suggest a, a permanent uh, a permanent situation of, of uh, revolution, permanent revolution. When we have to change the system, the system the will at, at the, the beginning will be fair and, 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 and equal and uh, well and democratic, but it will soon get a, a, a new totalization. So let's change the new one and let's change and the change and change. And, and he, he admires and on that. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 oh. Well, I mean, so just very general to say about the uh, question of violence. Uh, 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 states expand and intervene in other states. You commonly get surgeons of rebel rebel groups and so forth. Uh, uh, experience is instructive in that, in that regard in the sense of that. Patriotic Front emerged, apparently tried to assassinate the Nashe during the course of the military regime. And then withered away, there was this transition to democracy. And, uh, I'm sure there are many other clear, clear cut examples of how this works. This was a very weak group, final analysis. 
like roots in other countries, but that violence breeds violence. It's not, it's not what I would say is that uh, I think that what our issue in South Africa is that black South Africans would regard the state violence of the, of the party era as illegitimate, but my, I suspect a large number of white South Africans actually don't regard as illegitimate. So there's that, <coughs> that tension there between well, when is law legitimate or not, and I think it's part of the issue. I'm afraid I'm sticking with my dates. Uh, in South Africa, the, in 1833, slavery was abolished. In 1834, it was implemented. The reason then for the Great Trek, so when the Dutch moved <coughs> into the Inlands, uh, uh, my own family moved in 1828, so they were merely tax dodgers, they weren't part of the Great Trek, and they occupied land, so there it is. But in, in, uh, so, uh, uh, the issue was that, well, my history was taught us that the, uh, the Boers were upset, not because the slaves were being free, but they had to go to London to get their money. But I, I suspect, well, I think that it's a bit unreasonable, I think, but, yeah. Well, maybe 1838 for European or something. Yeah. And, see, so, so by 1838, the Boers were making deals uh, with de Gaan, and then we had this moment where, uh, from the Afrikaner perspective, uh, de Gaan reneged on the, on the agreement, and there was the famous Black Battle of Blood River on the 16th of December, 1838, when, according to my culture, God assisted us in defeating the Zulus uh, at that the Blood River. But, yeah, so that's, that's our story, but I don't really buy into it. In terms of Samir's question, um, it's a difficult one. I mean, uh, there's the case of, of the bells in Germany with Nazi insignia on it that are not, are not being moved. Um, uh, and I also was surprised to discover that in the 1950s, African students at UCT, I didn't know this, had actually tried to have the road statue removed already at the, at the, in, the, in the apartheid era. It's a, I suggested to the university, I'm the master of UCT, I suggested that we should, in fact, the university should have a, a, a sculpture competition and, and on the, in the place of roads, then every two or five years have a different sculpture engaging with the issue of identity and then have a sculpture path uh, where roads would also begin because roads is part of our history. So, yeah, so, so but, but I think removing him from the plinth there uh, in the center space, but not hiding him like in the Soviet Union in some kind of uh, black lot. But yeah, so, so, but it may be that black South Africans have a different perspective and then think that Rose is so offensive that he should in fact be removed or even destroyed. And yeah, so, so these are, I think, well the issue is that uh, South Africans are very, we are, we are, we are monologues, we are like shouting at each other and what is missing in our identity is dialogue. We don't have a system of dialogue. So I think using statues and what we do with them as a, a starting of process of dialogue is, is necessary. It's also necessary for our system of democracy to learn to talk to each other and not just shout at each other. And the, the risk of the, the populist wave is that it just continues the shouting at each other process and not engaging in dialogue. So I believe we should deal with the statutes in a manner that enables dialogue. That would be the best. The question on Quebec allows me to also answer. To pursue, which I didn't have a chance to develop because it's your in your 50 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, j just as the generation of the 1930s used French intellectual tools, um, so the generation that wanted to create local identities, Creole identities, uh, metissage, uh, uh, do a lot of French, the, the French theory, Deleuze and uh, Foucault. Uh, uh, Derrida. So uh, once again, we have the, the employment of the, the concepts of the center uh, to, de to develop a, a, a detachment uh, from the center. So, so the, 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 the first tendency was to try to create a, uh, to identify from literature, because, because now uh, because of the Ecole de Vitaine, everybody in the Caribbean is literate in French. Uh, and, and there's a large dimension of French literacy in Africa, although it's more restrained than it is uh, in the Caribbean, the Antilles. Uh, but the, 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 the next tendency, uh, was, uh, the critique of that, was that he, he, even though, for example, in Guadeloupe, the, the, the Guadeloupe or the Mart Martinique uh, uh, identity is not only African, and, and two phases of African 
uh, influence, not only the slave trade, but after the abolition of slavery, the, the basically the indentured workers, now from Congo, uh, were brought into uh, were brought into Africa. There was, there were Indians and, uh, from India, uh, with, with the, what's called in the, in the French West Indies, the Syrians from the they were basically Lebanese, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, and there's not only this biological uh, metissage. Uh, uh, so uh, an author like Raphael Confiant has written a series of books, and each book tends to, to focus on one of the components of this uh, Martinique identity, uh, including the, the, the influence of the United States on uh, the Creole identity. After all, the Caribbean is in America. Uh, so uh, we, and by the way, just an interesting footnote, both M.A. Cesare and Leopold Senghor say that the invention of negritude comes from the American authors, Langston Hughes and, and others. They, they say negritude was really the, the, the invention of the American authors in the 1920s and 1930s, which they took and, and universalized them. Uh, the, 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 the next tendency was to adopt Deleuze's idea of the rhizome, the rhizome. Instead of having roots, the rhizome moves out. Uh, yeah, and, and so we, we have an identity now that that draws on not not, not a rooted place, uh, but a more generalized. It's even universalized. So the, the idea is that there's there's the local that spreads out. Uh, to be more general, but there's also the universal, and that's why the the authors, uh, beginning with Edouard Glissant, uh, adopt as their own this white uh, son of a plantation owner, San John Curse, who was a famous diplomat, by the way, called Alexis de Chez, who was the chef de cabinet uh, 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 of Aristide uh, Briand, uh, the uh, because for they find in San John Curse a Creole writer who. who from his locality, finds a universal, uh, and of course, since the the the, the, uh, the Caribbeans are the, 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 uh, detached, the African or, or those of African origins are detached from their, their traditions. They, they build a creolite on the, the, the landscape, the traditions, the folkways, of case, a kind of emptiness. But they so there there are. Studies by the 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 Creole writers themselves, the Saint John Purse, would find that not only does he use Creole words or references, but his style uh, is is Creole. Uh, with long paraphrases. Just just one one thing. The reason I think that and the, the 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 literature from this region is the most vibrant is that the dilemma that these writers faced in both Africa and the Caribbean is. To what extent they can use the language of the master uh, for their own liberation, or to, to construct their own identity. So, the, their their plan was actually to twist talk French. So, in terms of style, that's what's innovative. Uh, they they take the French language, they bring in Creole dimensions and Creole style, and they, they break the language. And that was even the the announced uh, uh, perspective of Cesar, for example, and Senghor. And the same for Africa, uh, the famous uh, um, African writer Kuhuma, uh writes in a French that's heavily influenced by the uh, Malinke language, for example. Uh, and just in terms of, just one other thing, uh, in terms of violence, this is ambiguous because, um, you know, a country like Tunisia got its independence without violence. And, and why? Uh, because uh, I, the uh, Habib Bourguiba was so French, and in fact, in many ways, he saw himself as French. He was so French that he understood how the French functioned, and the French were continually stunned and nonplussed. And and Bourguiba was able to negotiate peacefully uh, an independence. Violence was not necessary. Uh, the, the, the same. One other thing. The same. The same for the. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Uh, We'll just take either Paul and Russell, and maybe if you just could make your comments briefly, and that'll, that'll conclude this. I, I, I can start all. Uh, I mean, if you need to go to a break, maybe well, we can have anything more. We started start 10 minutes late, so we'll go ahead. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I really enjoyed it all.
support your papers very much. It's just great. And I, I don't, um, the only um, question that I had was uh, in your mention of, of Fagel and his perception by living us. Um, I, I, I don't think I completely followed the logic there when he, when he was talking about living us critique of, of this sort of socializing logic of, of legal and similar sorts of schools of, of European class as it being a counterpoint, if I understood correctly, to the idea of uh, not completely otherizing the other. Right? And to admit that Levinas' contribution is, is to, to perceive the self as being centered also in the other, right? Um, but that, I'm just, I'm wondering is, I'm surprised, is, is, is this a reception of, of Hegel, of, of what Hegel has been said, or like a secularized version of Hegel? Because Hegel's definition of freedom is, is precisely uh, the ability of, of, of being able to see myself as at home in the other. That's, that's exactly people's definition of what freedom means. So it, it yeah. seems to be precisely in the Nazi's own uh, world. That's it. That's it. I think we're just going to take the question. Okay. I'll make a couple of brief comments and we'll continue in discussion afterwards. Um, I'll just sort of register a kind of objection to the Fanon uh, 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 matter. Uh, I think he's a massively overrated writer. He uh, exists because of the Sartre endorsement uh, and because his, his celebration of violence appeals to adolescent readers. Uh, uh, I think a serious discussion of violence would have to be, would have to involve, is the violent outcome in Algeria better than the relatively peaceful outcome in South Africa? Right? And if you want to endorse Fanon, you should say that you wish South Africa had the kind of violence, say, that accompanied the partition of, of, of India. Right? That's a Fanonian position. Right? And if you disagree with that, if you think that a relatively peaceful transition is better, then you know, maybe we should take Fanon off the reading list. Uh, he's just not that smart. Uh, on, the, um, on the question of, um, of statues, um, it's complex. And I wonder, you know, if stat do statues really matter, or is this just people you're giving money for art, art projects. But if you're, going to, if you're going to look into statues, then let's make it a more complicated field. There's the King statue in, uh, in Washington. Uh, uh, no one's going to call for that uh, removal. But it's interesting that in its construction, it's effectively eliminated all of the Christian components in, in King's legacy. He's presented as a secular civil rights activist. And the Christian natural law has been purged. So I think there's something deeply problematic with that statue. And there's the statue that um, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, uh, inaugurated in Trier of Karl Marx. So this is the European Union putting up a statue to Marx. The European Union includes many countries that suffered under Marxism. Should that statue be removed? And then finally, there's been an interesting event just recently at a, an art festival in Wiesbaden uh, in Germany uh, where the art, um, the, 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 um, the administration of the festival put up a statue, a golden statue of Erdogan uh, as a kind of provocation. And the Kurdish community was outraged and that's, that's been removed as well. So I think the, the Silent Sam and Rhodes, because they're, they're plugged into the black-white issue, have a certain kind of um, um, rigidity in the possible discussion of what statues are about. Well, thank you very much for the panel. I never got a, um, an opportunity to answer Bryce's question. <laughs> no answer to that question. Oh, uh, I guess I was, you were supposed to answer everything, I guess. <laughs> 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 I just, just went for an order. orderly. Well, I mean, my, my sense of order. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, we were, we're really way out of time. Oh, yeah. Why don't you just speak to Laura in our break? So we'll have a break now until 11. Uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>